the original manuscripts of all Bibles have been lost. They don't exist anymore, so all we have is copies of copies. Some of them are very old, some of them are less old. And there are basically three, although we will actually see there are only two, really, streams of Bibles. You, the ones that are uh, at the base, in other words, the oldest ones, are all lost manuscripts, so they are all copies of previous manuscripts. Now, as far as the Bible that led to the King James Version in the English language, they come from the central tree. These are, they, they are lost manuscripts of the traditional text, and they come basically from the Syriac, from the Gothic virgin, versions. There's a Codex W and a Codex A. And then there is a vast majority of extant texts which make up the New Testament manuscripts. And we're talking about 1,900 manuscripts in this central block, from which eventually we have the King James Version, and every other Bible, except the Roman Catholic and the Jesuit Bible, every single Bible in the world that was written before 1914. Every single one comes from here. Then there are two other streams. The one is the, uh, the one that le led to the Douay version, which is basically the Jesuit version. And the ancestor of Western family that is lost, and the text is an expansion of an original text, and there you have the old Latin version, you have the Latin Vulgate version, which the Pope declared to be infallible, you have Codex D, Codex D2, Codex E2, and the Douay version of 1582, which was written to counteract the Reformation. That's the one stream. And manuscripts belonging to the same family have the same text. They all agree closely in the wording. Then there's another tree, which is the ancestor of the Alexandrian family. And the original is also lost, of course, as we see. And there you have a few interesting documents. And these are relatively new, but they are old documents. They have been found lately. Papyrus 75, Codex B are two of them. Then you have Papyrus 66, and then the most famous of them all, Codex Aleph. And from this very small stream of four manuscripts, you have the Revised Version, the American Standard Version, the Revised Standard Version, and the New English Bible, and all the hosts of new ones that are coming out in all the languages of the world are based on these manuscripts over here. He told Moses, he said, Moses, 1,400 years before Christ, he said, Moses, write a book. Right. And the book that he wrote, of course, became what we understand today as the Pentateuch. First book in the Old Testament probably written was the book of Job. Dated somewhere, he's contemporary with Abraham around 1900 B.C. So if the last book in the Bible is the book of Revelation, it is. The canon of Scripture was closed somewhere about 90 to 95 A.D. We're looking at 2,000 years, almost, in the writing of the Word of God. That's a long time. If God inspired His book, and I believe He did, there is no purpose whatsoever in inspiring it if you don't preserve it. But as I begin to read the King James Bible for myself, I realize that there's something in this book that is not in the rest of them. Amen. And so I began to study on my own, found out there's two distinct lines of manuscripts. The other side would have you believe this doesn't exist. They'd have you think that all of this is just a bunch of made up nothing, but it's not. In 1889, in the revision committee, two men by the name of Westcott and Hort got into that committee and began to change things. Before the committee of 1889, there were two distinct lines of Bibles, Catholic, Protestant. And they were as clearly marked as they possibly could be, two separate lines. But in 1889, they blurred the lines. And they began to use a text created by, uh, by uh, Nestle Allen uh, that's uh, used today, the 27th edition, I think, 
is what is used now to translate Bibles from. And that text came from the corruption of Westcott and Hort. Westcott and Hort showed up in the latter part of the 1800s. It's very important to understand tonight, this is very important. Chronology is a big deal. I've taught Sunday school class this. Chronology is a big deal. Charles Darwin had not been out long with his origin of the species. He directly attacked the authority of the Word of God. He began to teach men that the book of Genesis was nothing but a fable and that men had evolved into what they are today. He was not new with that. Darwin was not new with the theory of evolution. The theory of evolution has been around a lot longer than Darwin. He just popularized it and published it. And he sent in when he did, a waiting audience heard everything he said. And Westcott and Hort were two that did. They praised his work to high heaven. Westcott and Hort embraced the theory of evolution and the work of Charles Darwin. What does that tell you? What does it tell you when you hear two men who are supposed to be Christian Bible believers say the work of, West, the work of, of Darwin is a marvelous work, wonderful thing. And the latter part of the 1800s gave birth to a spiritist movement in this country and the world. The school of theosophy began to develop. Uh, uh, Helena Bolovatsky, which was a Russian, began to develop what this old occult doctrine been around a long time, but she published her works, The Secret Doctrine. And The Secret Doctrine gave birth to the Theosophist Society in America, and it gave birth to the occult movement in this country. And the basis of that, here's what this lady says, who researched it, her name is Barbara Aho. Here's what she says about the contribution of Westcott and Hort. She says, Westcott and Hort, the contribution of Westcott and Hort to the modern spiritualism and global integration is indeed vast and is increasing exponentially. As the modern prophets of occult traditions receive international power to give full expression to mystery Babylon. This lady right here lays it directly at the doorstep of Westcott and Hort as being the two that initiated into the church spiritism occultism and you've seen where it is today with the emerging church movement and with what's going out there in california and uh all this other stuff that i've been teaching in sunday school this is not about all that tonight but there's a tie-in these things are connected all right now this is why i harp on stuff like this and, and so much and have for so long is because i know my enemy I know his tactics, I know where he dwells, I know who he is, and uh, I'm not going to cut him any slack. I'm going to come after him with everything I've got. If I, if I assault his stronghold, I will assault his stronghold with the Word of God. Now, we know who Lucifer is, don't we? We know who he is. All right, now here's what's happened to most people today. They're kept, they're kept in ignorance. And they're fed the idea that the Bibles, all these new Bibles, are for their benefit so that they can understand the Scripture better. At least wise, that was the uh, position they took years ago when they started proliferating Bibles on the market. And uh, uh, the, the idea was, well, here's a better translation. You can understand this better. You know, this speaks to our generation today. Uh, the King James Bible is archaic, and, and we have access to better manuscripts now. And the King James Bible has uh, mistakes in it and errors. And so we want to clear up all of this problem. And so we came out with the, with the revised version of 1880, 1889. And then we came out with the American Standard Version of 1901. Then we came out with the New American Standard Version. Then we came out with the, uh, finally, the granddaddy, the NIV. And then we came out with a New American Standard Version. And then we came out with Living Bible and then Good Speed and then the Dog Patch Version. And then the Amplified Bible. And then it continues on and on and on. Lord only knows how many Bibles, different translations, there are on the market. The revisers of the Bible in 1881 intended to revise it from the text that had always been used, the Universal Greek text, the Texas Receptus, the Received Text. But these two, Westcott and Hort, projected themselves into the revision committee and got them to use an entirely different Greek text than had been used. They used the Alexandrian Greek text. 
And the Alexandrian Greek text is the Greek text that the Roman Catholic Church had always used. It was not the text of Erasmus and Stephanus and Alzever and Colonnaeus and Beza and those men. It was the text of Alexandria, the Alexandrian Greek text. Matthew chapter 4 verse 4. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Obviously it's important that we know the word of God. Isaiah chapter 8 verse 20 says, To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. In other words, if you do not speak according to the word of God, and if you do not speak according to the testimony, that which the prophets have iterated regarding God's actions, which had to be in harmony with the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, then there is no light in them. So don't come with something contrary to the word of God. Revelations 22 verse 18 says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, and out of the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. That's pretty serious. Now, today we have many Bibles. And there are hosts of translations of the Bibles. Now, which one is the best? They will tell you that the modern ones are the best. And yes, in many ways, with the modern Greek scholarship, a lot of the verses in the modern Bibles have better translations than in the old versions because of better knowledge of the Greek terminology. But if the grammar is improved, does that necessarily mean that the context have, has to be improved or changed? That's when you get into trouble. The seat of their text. In plain words, it was the seat of worldly wisdom. That's the idea. It is the seat of worldly wisdom as interpreted by the mind of a natural man instead of the seat of revelation from God. Where were the Christians first called Christians? Of what? Not Alexandria, where? Syria. Syria. And that says that in the book of Acts. They were first called Christians in Antioch of Syria. So from Syria came what's called the Syrian type text. In plain words, the source of the received text or the textus receptus originated in the very, in the very stronghold of men and women 2,000 years ago that believed the way you do. They were fundamental to the faith, true to the word of God. They stuck with the book. Instead of going with worldly wisdom of Alexandria, Egypt, they stayed with Scripture. They, they, knew, they were born again. And from them came the Textus Receptus, or the Received Text. That was the origins of it. And so you have two distinct lines of text. You have a, text of, you have a, you have a line of text, which is, the, uh, which is the Received Text, Textus Receptus, which simply means a text that is received. And, and it was the majority text. It's also called that. It's called received text, text receptus, majority text, because over 5,000, 5,000 pieces, parts, parts of books, whole books, are gathered together to form this vast body of manuscripts that make up the received text. Over here you have some rolled up documents, not near as many, that among themselves they disagree thousands and thousands and thousands of times. One of them's called the Sinaiticus Vaticanus. One is called a Washingtonius. Some of them are called by different names. One of them was found in a wastebasket by a fellow named Tischendorf at the Sinai Monastery down there in the desert. It was in a garbage can. That's where it belonged. <laughs> Should have left it there. But you got all these, you got all, you got these texts over here that disagree among themselves thousands and thousands and thousands of times, been rejected by the church of God for 2,000 years. Then we have over here the received text. What happens? Westcott and Hort come in, push this out, and pull this in, and base their new translations on this. 
Now listen carefully. Every single translation since then is based on that. Um, it's nothing but a mockery and a joke. If you inspire the scripture, and the Bible says the scripture cannot be broken, then therefore you must preserve it. It behooves us tonight, since we are inundated with countless Bible translations, to make certain that what we have in our hand is the Word of God. Because the Bible said that you're begotten by the Word. So why do I believe the King James Bible is the Word of God? I hadn't been saved long when I got off into good news for modern man, the living Bible, and all the rest of them. I was searching. I was looking for something. I was sincere in my effort to know as much as I possibly could, and I was told the lie that the King James Bible is a good book, but it's archaic, and you need one that talks to you in the language of today. So we got the living Bible, and I began to read it. As I read it, I thought to myself, this thing doesn't talk to me. And I got so many other Bibles, read them, they didn't talk to me. They didn't talk to me. I mean, I read it, I read the, liter the literature of it, but it just didn't talk. And the King James Bible had a, had a way of talking. It was just something I could not put my foot on, but it was, it was hand on, but it's different. Gail Ripplinger was a professor of uh, history or something at Kent State University. Gail Ripplinger was teaching her students, and she taught female students, and I'm not sure if that's all, but she taught them. And they would come to her with their problems. And Gail Ripplinger and I, we, she's been here at Temple Baptist Church, and let me say this of this lady, she is one of the finest, sweetest ladies I've ever met in my life, and she's got a brain between her shoulders. And this woman was a professor at Kent State University. These young ladies come to her, and they'd be complaining about their problems, boy problems, whatever. She tried to help them, and she is a Christian. And she learned by experience with these young ladies that the ones that use the NIV and the other Bibles just didn't seem to get the help and didn't seem to be able to grow in the faith like the ones that had the King James Bible. She was not predisposed to anything. This is a woman that had an open mind, set about to do her own investigation. Being educated as she was, she knew how to research, and she delved into the issue of manuscript evidence. And after a, after a considerable amount of study, personal study, not being affected by anybody's Baptist college, Methodist college, Catholic university, nothing. This was totally on her own. She came out absolutely and completely convinced that the King James Bible is absolutely God Almighty's word and that there is a sinister force. There is a sinister motive involved in the creation of all the other Bibles. And she wrote a book, published it, the name of it is New Age Bible Versions. She came to this conclusion on independent study, no money to be made from it, wasn't trying to impress anybody, didn't join anybody's club, didn't have a bunch of accolades laid upon her. As a matter of fact, some of the great leaders of the Baptist independent fundamental movement laid into her and began to criticize this woman and hadn't even read her book. Say I have developed a new brand of chicken to sell to someone. And I have a wonderful recipe which I'm now going to base a franchise on and I send it to every country in the world and they're going to follow this recipe by the letter and we're going to sell uh, blue pumpkin chicken or whatever in this franchise. Now everybody gets the original recipe and diligently translates it because the Germans need it in German and the Portuguese need it in Portuguese and the Spanish in Spanish, etc. So each one diligently copies it. And now there are literally thousands of copies in various languages of the original one that was written and sent out. Over the years the original one gets copied so many times that it, it falls apart. So all you have is copies. That's all you have. And then one day, somebody says to himself, you know, that's a pretty good recipe. I wish I could just change it a little bit and steal the franchise for myself. So he alters the recipe and says, hello folks, I've got the original recipe. Here it is. You know, he burns it a little bit and makes it look old and what have you. Not that this happened there, but anyway, he's got the original, manu the original recipe. And he starts his franchise with the new recipe. 
And now everybody says, wow, well, which one is now the original one? This one or that one? This is highly problematic. Now we have two. Which one is the right one? Well, what do you do? You say, now hang on a second. The original one has been copied and translated in so many different languages. Let's get the German one and the Spanish one and the Greek one and the this one and the Armenian one and the Serbian one and we'll check it out and lo and behold, they all agree with this one but not with that one. Which one was then the original one? The one that has the cloud of witnesses supporting it, yes or no? Okay, and that you'll find only in the central stream. There's a cloud of witnesses in the central stream. I mean, there are just 1,900 documents there alone that all agree. Now, the originals have been copied so much, many times, they're gone. But, and now this is interesting, in this stream over here, there are many verses gone, just absolutely gone. And in this stream over here, there are many verses that are just gone, that are in this stream over here. Now, we don't have the original manuscripts, so the, the, the followers of this stream say, ah, they weren't in the original. After all, these are old documents. And this stream says they weren't in the original. You see what they're saying? But what if you had very ancient letters from the church fathers, which often obviously weren't as copied as much as the Bible was, as a document. And you have very ancient letters from very ancient church fathers writing to each other. Now, if I write a letter to my wife, for example, I'm sitting in this country and she's in another country and I write her a nice letter, and I'm encouraging her, giving her a few quotes out of the Bible. That everybody does, isn't that so? So we have these ancient letters, and there are quotes of verses which don't happen to appear there. But the letters are older than those manuscripts. Then which one would be the right one? Which one would you suggest? Then obviously the ones that are in line with here, the center, because they're quoting verses that don't even exist in those. And that is the case. That's how it is.